Two Short Catechisms by John Owen. Two short catechisms wherein the principles of the doctrine of Christ are unfolded and explained. Proper for all persons to learn before they be admitted to the sacrament of the Lord's Supper and composed for the use of all congregations in general. Come, ye children, hearken unto me, I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Psalm 34, verse 11. Prefatory Note the first edition of these catechisms issued from the press in 1645. Dr. Owen had at that time the charge of the parish of Fordham in Essex, and laboured diligently for the instruction and benefit of his flock by catechising from house to house. The catechisms were prepared in order that they might accomplish these parochial duties with greater efficiency and success. The lesser catechism is designed for the instruction of children, the greater for the examinations of persons more advanced in years. They are chiefly doctrinal. It was the intention of Owen to have followed up this little work by another catechism on the Lord's Prayer, the Ten Commandments, and some articles of the Creed. This intention, however, was never fulfilled. These catechisms on the principles of the doctrine of Christ are included in this volume, which embodies all the treatises of Owen directly relating to the second person of the Trinity, inasmuch as, according to a statement of the author in the preface, they were intended to remind his people of what he had publicly taught them, especially concerning the person and offices of Christ. They were among the first, as the other treatises in this volume are among the last, of our author's publications, and we are thus enabled to mark the undeviating consistency with which, during all the ministrations of his public course, Owen held fast by the great doctrines of the gospel, the unsearchable riches of Christ. Editor To my loving neighbours and Christian friends, Brethren, my heart's desire and request unto God for you is that you may be saved. I say the truth in Christ also I lie not, my conscience bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for them amongst you, who, as yet, walk disorderly, and not as beseemeth the gospel, little labouring to acquaint themselves with the mystery of godliness. For many walk, of whom I have told you often with weeping, and tell you now again with sorrow, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, who mind earthly things. You know, brethren, how I have been amongst you, and in what manner, for these few years past, and how I have kept back nothing, to the utmost of the dispensation to me committed, that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to all repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. Now with what sincerity this hath been by me performed, with what issue and success by you received, God the righteous judge will one day declare. For before him must both you and I appear, to give an account of the dispensation of the glorious gospel amongst us. In the meanwhile the desire of my heart is to be servant to the least of you in the work of the Lord, and that in any way which I can conceive profitable unto you, either in your persons or your families. Now amongst my endeavours in this kind, after the ordinance of public preaching the word, there is not, I conceive, any more needful, as all will grant, that know the estate of this place, how taught of late days, how full of grossly ignorant persons, than catechizing, which hath caused me to set aside some hours for the compiling of these following, which also I have procured to be printed, merely because the least part of the parish are able to read it in writing, my intention in them being, principally, to hold out those necessary truths wherein you have been in my preaching more fully instructed, as they are, the use of them I shall briefly present unto you. One, the lesser catechism, may be so learned of the younger sort, that they may be ready to answer to every question thereof. Two, the greater will call to mind much of what hath been taught you in public, especially concerning the person and offices of Jesus Christ. Three, out of that you may have help to instruct your families in the lesser, being so framed for the most part, that a chapter of the one is spent in unfolding the question of the other. 4. The texts of Scripture quoted are diligently to be sought out and pondered, that you may know indeed whether these things are so. 
5. In reading the wood you may have light into the many of many places by considering what they are produced to confirm. 6. I have been sparing in the doctrine of the sacraments because I have already been so frequent in examinations about them. 7. The handling of moral duties I have wholly omitted because, by God's assistance, I intend for you a brief explication of the Lord's Prayer and the Ten Commandments, with some articles of the Creed not unfolded in these by themselves by the way of question and answer. Now in all this, as the pains hath been mine, so I pray that the benefit may be yours, and the praise his, to whom alone any good that is in this or anything else is to be ascribed. Now the God of heaven continue that peace, love, and amity amongst ourselves, which hitherto hath been unshaken in these divided times, and grant that the sceptre and kingdom of his Son may be gloriously advanced in your hearts, that the things which concern your peace may not be hidden from your eyes in this your day, which is the daily prayer of your servant in the work of the Lord, J. O. From my study, September the last, 1645. The Lesser Catechism. Question. Whence is all truth concerning God and ourselves to be learned? Answer. From the Holy Scripture, the Word of God. Chapter 1 of the Greater Catechism. Question. What do the Scriptures teach that God is? Answer. An eternal, infinite, most holy Spirit, giving being to all things and doing with them whatsoever he pleaseth. Chapter 2. Question. Is there but one God? Answer. One only in respect of his essence and being, but one in three distinct persons, of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Chapter 3. Question. What else is held forth in the word concerning God that we ought to know? Answer. His decrees and his works. Chapter 4. Question. What are the decrees of God concerning us? Answer. His eternal purposes of saving some by Jesus Christ for the praise of his glory and of condemning others for their sins. Chapter 5. Question. What are the works of God? Answer. Acts or doings of his power whereby he createth, sustaineth, and governeth all things. Chapter 6. Question. What is required from us towards Almighty God? Answer. Holy and spiritual obedience according to his law given unto us. Chapter 7. Question. Are we able to do this of ourselves? Answer. No, in no wise, being by nature unto every good work reprobate. Chapter 7. Question. How came we into this estate, being at the first created in the image of God in righteousness and innocency? Answer. By the fall of our first parents, breaking the covenant of God, losing his grace and deserving his curse. Chapter 8. Question. By what way may we be delivered from this miserable estate? Answer. Only by Jesus Christ. Chapter 9. Question. What is Jesus Christ? Answer. God and man united in one person to be a mediator between God and man. Chapter 10. Question. What is he unto us? Answer. A king, a priest, and a prophet. Chapter 11. Question. Wherein doth he exercise his kingly power towards us? Answer. In converting us unto God by his Spirit, subduing us unto his obedience, and ruling in us by his grace. Chapter 12. Question. In what doth the exercise of his priestly office for us chiefly consist? Answer. In offering up himself an acceptable sacrifice on the cross, so satisfying the justice of God for our sins, removing his curse from our persons, and bringing us unto him. Chapter 13. Question. Wherein doth Christ exercise his prophetical office towards us? Answer. In revealing to our hearts, from the bosom of his Father, the way and truth whereby we must come unto him. Chapter 13. Question. In what condition doth Jesus Christ exercise these offices? Answer. He did it in a lower state of humiliation on earth, but now in a glorious state of exaltation in heaven. Chapter 14. Question. For whose sake doth Christ perform all these? Answer. Only for his elect. Chapter 15. Question. What is the Church of Christ? Answer. The universal company of God's elect, called to the adoption of children. Chapter 16. Question. How come we to be members of this Church? Answer. By a lively faith. Chapter 17. Question. What is a lively faith? 
answer, an assured resting of the soul upon God's promises of mercy in Jesus Christ, for pardon of sins here and glory hereafter. Chapter 18. Question. How come we to have this faith? Answer. By the effectual working of the Spirit of God in our hearts, freely calling us from the state of nature to the state of grace. Chapter 18. Question. Are we accounted righteous for our faith? Answer. No, but only for the righteousness of Christ freely imputed unto us and laid hold of by faith. Chapter 19. Question. 1. Is there no more required of us but faith only? Answer. Yes, repentance also and holiness. Chapter 20. Question. 2. What is repentance? Answer. A forsaking of all sin with godly sorrow for what we have committed. Chapter 20. Question. 3. What is that holiness which is required of us? Answer. Universal obedience to the will of God revealed unto us. Chapter 20. Question. What are the privileges of believers? Answer. First, union with Christ. Secondly, adoption of children. Thirdly, communion of saints. Fourthly, right to the seals of the new covenant. Fifthly, Christian liberty. Sixthly, resurrection of the body to life eternal. Chapter 21. Question 1. What are the sacraments or seals of the new covenant? Answer. Visible seals of God's spiritual promises made unto us in the blood of Jesus Christ. Chapter 22. Question 2. Which be they? Answer. Baptism and the Lord's Supper. Question. What is baptism? Answer. A holy ordinance whereby, being sprinkled with water according to Christ's institution, we are, by his grace, made children of God, and have the promises of the covenant sealed unto us. Chapter 23. Question. What is the Lord's Supper? Answer. A holy ordinance of Christ, appointed to communicate unto believers his body and blood spiritually, being represented by bread and wine, blessed, broken, poured out, and received of them. Chapter 24. Question. Who have a right unto this sacrament? Answer. They only who have an interest in Jesus Christ by faith. Chapter 24. Question. What is the communion of saints? Answer. A holy conjunction between all God's people, partakers of the same spirit and members of the same mystical body. Chapter 25. Question. What is the end of all this dispensation? Answer. The glory of God in our salvation. Glory be to God on high. The Greater Catechism, Chapter 1, of the Scripture. Question 1. What is Christian religion? Answer. The only way of knowing God aright and living unto Him. Footnotes. Everyone out of this way everlastingly damned. The life of religion is in the life. End footnotes. John 14, verse 5 and 6. Chapter 17, verse 3. Acts 4 verse 12, Colossians 1 verse 10, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 15, Galatians 2 verses 19 and 20. Question 2. Whence is it to be learned? Answer. From the Holy Scripture only. Footnotes. Popish traditions are false lights leading from God. In footnotes. Isaiah 8 verse 20, John 5 verse 39. Question 3. What is the Scripture? Answer. The books of the Old and New Testament, given by inspiration from God, containing all things necessary to be believed and done, that God may be worshipped and our souls saved. Footnotes. The authority of this scripture dependeth not on the authority of the church, as the papists blaspheme. All human inventions unnecessary helps in the worship of God. The word thereof is the sole directory for faith, worship, and life. End footnotes. Isaiah 8 verse 20, Romans 3 verse 2, Revelation 22 verses 19 and 20, 2 Timothy 3 verses 16 and 17, Psalm 19 verses 7 and 8, Jeremiah 7 verse 13, John 20 verse 31. Question 4. How know you them to be the word of God? Answer, by the testimony of God's Spirit, working faith in my heart, to close with that heavenly majesty and clear divine truth that shineth in them. Footnotes, this alone persuadeth and inwardly convinceth the heart of the divine verity of the scripture. 
other motives also there are from without and unanswerable arguments to prove the truth of them as one their antiquity two preservation from fury three prophecies in them four the holiness and majesty of their doctrine agreeable to the nature of god five miracles six the testimony of the church of all ages seven the blood of innumerable martyrs etc End footnotes matthew sixteen verse seventeen john six verse thirteen one thessalonians two verse thirteen one john two verse twenty chapter five verse six luke twenty four verse thirty two one corinthians two verse fourteen hebrews four verse twelve two peter one verse nineteen the greater catechism chapter two of god question one what do the scriptures teach concerning god answer first what he is or his nature secondly what he doth or his works exodus three verse fourteen isaiah forty five verse six hebrews one verses one to three chapter eleven verse six question two what is god in himself answer an eternal infinite incomprehensible spirit giving being to all things and doing with them whatsoever he pleaseth footnotes the perfection of god's being is known of us chiefly by removing all imperfections hence the abominable vanity of idolaters and of the blasphemous papists that picture god let us prostrate ourselves in holy adoration of that which we cannot comprehend End footnotes. Deuteronomy 33 verse 27, Isaiah 57 verse 15, Revelation 1 verse 8, 1 Kings 8 verse 27, Psalm 139 verses 2 to 5, etc. Exodus 33 verse 20, 1 Timothy 6 verse 16, John 4 verse 24, Genesis 1 verse 1, Psalm 115 verse 3, psalm 135 verse 6 isaiah 46 verse 10 john 5 verse 17 hebrews 1 verse 2 question 3 do we here know god as he is answer no his glorious being is not of us in this life to be comprehended exodus 33 verse 23 1 corinthians 13 verse 12 question 4 whereby is god chiefly made known unto us in the word answer first by his names secondly by his attributes or properties exodus three verse fourteen chapter six verse three psalm eighty three verse eighteen exodus thirty four verses six and seven matthew five verse forty eight question five what are the names of god answer glorious titles which he hath given himself to hold forth his excellencies unto us with some perfections whereby he will reveal himself footnotes the diverse names of god signify one and the same thing but under diverse notions in respect of our conception in footnotes exodus three verse fourteen and fifteen chapter six verse three chapter thirty four verses six and seven genesis seventeen verse one Question 6. What are the attributes of God? Answer. His infinite perfections in being and working. Revelation 4, verses 8 to 11. Question 7. What are the chief attributes of His being? Answer. Eternity, infiniteness, simplicity or purity, all-sufficiency, perfectness, immutability, life, will and understanding. Footnotes. Some of these attributes belong so unto god as that they are in no sort to be ascribed to any else as infiniteness eternity etc others are after a sort attributed to some of his creatures in that he communicateth unto them some of the effects of them in himself as life goodness etc the first of these are motives to humble adoration fear self-abhorrency the other to faith hope love and confidence through jesus christ End footnotes deuteronomy thirty three verse twenty seven psalm ninety three verse two isaiah fifty seven verse fifteen revelation one verse eleven one kings eight verse twenty seven psalm one hundred thirty nine verses one to four and verses eight to ten exodus three verse fourteen genesis seventeen verse one 
Psalm 135, verses 4 to 6, Job 11, verses 7 to 9, Romans 11, verses 33 to 36, Malachi 3, verse 6, James 1, verse 17, Judges 8, verse 19, 1 Samuel 25, verse 34, 2 Kings 3, verse 14, Ezekiel 14, verse 16, chapter 16, verse 48, Matthew 16, verse 16, Acts 14, verse 15, 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 9, Daniel 4, verse 35, Isaiah 46, verse 10, Ephesians 1, verse 5 and 11, James 1, verse 18, Psalm 7, verse 8, Psalm 139, verse 2, Psalm 147, verse 4, Jeremiah 11, verse 20, Hebrews 4, verse 13. Question 8. What are the attributes which usually are ascribed to him in his works or the acts of his will? Answer. Goodness, power, justice, mercy, holiness, wisdom, and the like, which he delighteth to exercise towards his creatures for the praise of his glory. Footnotes. Nothing is to be ascribed unto God, nor imagined of him, but what is exactly agreeable to those his glorious properties. These last are no less essential unto God than the former, only we thus distinguish them, because these are chiefly seen in his works. In footnotes. Psalm 119, verse 68, Matthew 19, verse 17, Exodus 15, verse 11, Psalm 62, verse 11, Revelation 19, verse 1, Zephaniah 3, verse 5, Psalm 11, verse 7, Jeremiah 12, verse 1, Romans 1, verse 32, Psalm 130, verse 7, Romans 9, verse 15, Ephesians 2, verse 4, Exodus 15, verse 11, Joshua 24, verse 19, Habakkuk 1, verse 13, Revelation 4, verse 8, Romans 11, verse 33, Chapter 16, verse 27. The Greater Catechism, Chapter 3, of the Holy Trinity. Question 1. Is there but one God to whom these properties do belong? Answer. One only in respect of his essence and being, but one in three distinct persons of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, Matthew 19, verse 17, Ephesians 4, verses 5 and 6, Genesis 1, verse 26, 1 John 5, verse 7, Matthew 28, verse 19. Question 2. What mean you by person? Answer. A distinct manner of subsistence or being distinguished from the other persons by its own properties. Footnotes. This is that mysterious ark that must not be pried into, nor the least tittle spoken about wherein plain scripture goeth not before. To deny the deity of any one person is in effect to deny the whole Godhead, for whosoever hath not the Son hath not the Father. This only doctrine remained undefiled in the papacy. and footnotes. John 5, verse 17, Hebrews 1, verse 3. Question 3. What is the distinguishing property of the person of the Father? Answer. To be of himself only the fountain of the Godhead. John 5, verses 26 and 27, Ephesians 1, verse 3. Question 4. What is the property of the Son? Answer. To be begotten of his Father from eternity. Psalm 2, verse 7. John 1, verse 14. Chapter 3, verse 16. Question 5. What of the Holy Ghost? Answer. To proceed from the Father and the Son. John 14, verse 17. Chapter 16, verse 14. Chapter 15, verse 26. Chapter 20, verse 22. Question 6. Are these three one? Answer. One, every way, in nature, will, and essential properties, distinguished only in their personal manner of subsistence. John 10, verse 30, Romans 3, verse 30, John 15, verse 26, 1 John 5, verse 7. Question 7. Can we conceive these things as they are in themselves? Answer. Neither we, nor yet the angels of heaven, are at all able to dive into these secrets as they are internally in God, but in respect of the outward dispensation of themselves to us by creation, redemption, and sanctification, a knowledge may be attained of these things, saving and heavenly. Footnotes. We must labor to make out comfort from the proper work of every person towards us. End footnotes. 
1 Timothy 6, verse 16, Isaiah 6, verses 2 and 3, Colossians 1, verses 11 to 14. End of section 5. The Greater Catechism, chapter 4, of the works of God, and first of those that are internal and imminent. Question 1. What do the Scriptures teach concerning the works of God? Answer, that they are of two sorts. First, internal, in his counsel, decrees, and purposes towards his creatures. Secondly, external, in his works over and about them, to the praise of his own glory. Footnotes. The purposes and decrees of God, so far as by him revealed, are objects of our faith, and full of comfort. And footnotes. Acts 15 verse 18, Proverbs 16 verse 4. Question 2. What are the decrees of God? Answer. Eternal, unchangeable purposes of His will concerning the being and well-being of His creatures. Footnotes. Farther reasons of God's decrees than His own will, not to be inquired after. The changes in the scripture ascribed unto God are only in the outward dispensations and works, variously tending to one infallible event by him proposed. The Arminian's blasphemy in saying God sometimes fails of his purposes. And footnotes. Micah 5 verse 2, Ephesians 3 verses 9 to 11, Acts 15 verse 18, Isaiah 14 verse 24, chapter 46 verse 10, Romans 9, verse 11, 2 Timothy 2, verse 19. Question 3. Concerning which of his creatures chiefly are his decrees to be considered? Answer. Angels and men, for whom other things were ordained. 1 Timothy 5, verse 21, Jude 6. Question 4. What are the decrees of God concerning men? Answer. Election and reprobation. Romans 9, verses 11 to 13. Question 5. What is the decree of election? Answer. The eternal, free, immutable purpose of God, whereby, in Jesus Christ, he chooseth unto himself, whom he pleaseth out of whole mankind, determining to bestow upon them for his sake, grace here and everlasting happiness hereafter, for the praise of his glory, by the way of mercy. Footnotes. The decree of election is the foundation of all spiritual graces, for they are bestowed only on the elect. In nothing doth natural corruption more exalt itself against God than in opposing the freedom of His grace in His eternal decrees. From the execution of these decrees flows that variety and difference we see in the dispensation of the means of grace, God sending the gospel where He hath a remnant according to election. End footnotes. Ephesians 1 verse 4, Acts 13 verse 48, Romans 8 verse 29 and 30, Matthew 11 verse 26, 2 Timothy 2 verse 19, Ephesians 1 verses 4 and 5, Matthew 22 verse 14, Romans 11 verses 18 to 21, John 6 verse 37, chapter 17 verses 6, 9, 11 and 24. Question 6. Doth anything in us move the Lord thus to choose us from amongst others? Answer. No, in no wise. We are in the same lump with others rejected, when separated by his undeserved grace. Romans 9, verses 11 and 12. Matthew 11, verse 25. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 7. 2 Timothy 1, verse 9. Question 7. What is the decree of reprobation? Answer the eternal purpose of God to suffer many to sin, leave them in their sin, and not giving them to Christ, to punish them for their sin. Romans 9, verses 11, 12, 21, 22. Proverbs 16, verse 4. Matthew 11, verse 25 and 26. 2 Peter 2, verse 12. Jude 4. End of section 6. Section 7 of Two Short Catechisms by John Owen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Greater Catechism, Chapter 5, of the Works of God that Outwardly Are of Him. 
Question 1. What are the works of God that outwardly respect his creatures? Answer. First, of creation. Secondly, of actual providence. Footnotes. The very outward works of God are sufficient to convince men of his eternal power and Godhead, and to leave them inexcusable if they serve him not. End footnotes. Psalm 33 verse 9, Hebrews 1 verses 2 and 3. Question 2. What is the work of creation? Answer. An act or work of God's almighty power, whereby of nothing in six days he created heaven, earth, and the sea, with all things in them contained. Genesis 1 verse 1, Exodus 20 verse 11, Proverbs 16 verse 4. Question 3. Wherefore did God make man? Answer. For his own glory in his service and obedience. Footnotes. The glory of God is to be preferred above our own either being or well-being as the supreme end of them. The approaching unto God in his service is the chief exaltation of our nature above the beasts that perish. And footnotes. Genesis 1 verses 26 and 27, chapter 2 verse 16 and 17, Romans 9 verse 23. Question 4. Was man able to yield the service and worship that God required of him? Answer, yea, to the uttermost, being created upright in the image of God, in purity, innocency, righteousness, and holiness. Genesis 1 verse 26, Ecclesiastes 7 verse 29, Ephesians 4 verse 24, Colossians 3 verse 10. Question 5. What was the rule whereby man was at first to be directed in his obedience? Answer, the moral or eternal law of God, implanted in his nature and written in his heart by creation, being the tenor of the covenant between God and him, sacramentally typified by the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Footnotes, God never allowed from the beginning that the will of the creatures should be the measure of his worship and honor. End footnotes. Genesis 2 verses 15 to 17 Romans 2, verses 14 and 15, Ephesians 4, verse 24. Question 6. Do we stand in the same covenant still, and have we the same power to yield obedience unto God? Answer. No. The covenant was broken by the sin of Adam, with whom it was made, our nature corrupted, and all power to do good utterly lost. Footnotes. Though we have all lost our right unto the promise of the first covenant, Yet all not restored by Christ are under the commination and curse thereof. End footnotes. Genesis 3 verses 16 to 18, Galatians 3 verses 10, 11, and 21, Hebrews 7 verse 19, chapter 8 verse 13, Job 14 verse 4, Psalm 51 verse 5, Genesis 6 verse 5, Jeremiah 13 verse 23. The Greater Catechism, Chapter 6 of God's Actual Providence Question 1. What is God's actual providence? Answer. The effectual working of his power and almighty act of his will, whereby he sustaineth, governeth, and disposeth of all things, men, and their actions, to the ends which he hath ordained for them. Footnotes To this providence is to be ascribed all the good we do enjoy, and all the afflictions we undergo. Fortune, chance, and the like are names without things, scarce fit to be used among Christians, seeing providence certainly ruleth all to appointed ends. No free will in man exempted either from the eternal decree or the overruling providence of God. End footnotes. Exodus 4, verse 11, Job 5, verses 10 to 12, Chapter 9, verses 5 and 6, Psalm 147, verse 4, Proverbs 15, verse 3, Isaiah 45, verses 6 and 7, John 5, verse 17, Acts 17, verse 28, Hebrews 1, verse 3. Question 2. How is this providence exercised towards mankind? Answer. In two ways. First, peculiarly towards his church or elect in their generations, for whom are all things. Secondly, towards all in a general manner, yet with various and diverse dispensations. 
Deuteronomy 32, verse 10, Psalm 17, verse 8, Zechariah 2, verse 8, Matthew 16, verse 18, chapter 19, verses 2 and 29, 1 Peter 5, verse 7, Genesis 9, verse 5, Psalm 75, verses 6 and 7, Isaiah 45, verses 6 and 7, Matthew 5, verse 45. Question 3. Wherein chiefly consists the outward providence of God towards his church? Answer in three things. First, in causing all things to work together for their good. Secondly, in ruling and disposing of kingdoms, nations, and persons for their benefit. Thirdly, in avenging them of their adversaries. Footnotes. Though the dispensations of God's providence towards his people be various, yet every issue and act of it tends to one certain end, their good in his glory. End footnotes. Matthew 6, verses 31 to 33, Romans 8, verse 28, 1 Timothy 6, verse 17, 2 Peter 1, verse 3, Psalm 105, verses 14 and 15, Isaiah 44, verse 28, Daniel 2, verse 44, Romans 9, verse 17, Isaiah 40, verse 12, Zechariah 12, verses 2 to 5, Luke 18, verse 7, Revelation 17, verse 14. Question 4. Doth God rule also in and over the sinful actions of wicked men? Answer. Yea, he willingly, according to his determinate counsel, suffereth them to be, for the manifestation of his glory, and by them effecteth his own righteous ends. Footnotes. Almighty God knows how to bring light out of darkness, good out of evil, the salvation of his elect out of Judas's treachery, the Jews' cruelty, and Pilate's injustice. In footnotes. 2 Samuel 12, verse 11, chapter 16, verse 10, 1 Kings 11, verse 31, chapter 22, verse 22, Job 1, verse 21, Proverbs 22, verse 14, Isaiah 10, verses 6 and 7, Ezekiel 21, verses 9 to 21, Amos 7, verse 17, Acts 4, verses 27 and 28, Romans 1, verse 24, chapter 9, verse 22, 1 Peter 2, verse 8, Revelation 17, verse 17. Question 5. Doth the providence of God extend itself to every small thing? Answer. The least grass of the field hair of our heads or worm of the earth is not exempted from his knowledge and care. Job 39, Psalm 104, verse 21, Psalm 145, verse 15, Jonah 4, verse 7, Matthew 6, verses 26 to 29, chapter 10, verses 29 to 30. The Greater Catechism, chapter 7, of the Law of God. Question 1. Which is the law that God gave man at first to fulfill? Answer, the same, which was afterwards written with the finger of God in two tables of stone on Mount Horeb, called the Ten Commandments. Footnotes, this law of God bindeth us now, not because delivered to the Jews on Mount Horeb, but because written in the hearts of all by the finger of God at the first. End footnotes. Romans 2, verses 14 and 15. Question 2, is the observation of this law still required of us? Answer, yes, to the outermost tittle. Matthew 5, verse 17, 1 John 3, verse 4, Romans 3, verse 31, James 2, verses 8 to 10, Galatians 3. Question 3. Are we able of ourselves to perform it? Footnotes. After the fall, the law ceased to be a rule of justification and became a rule for sanctification only. It is of free grace that God giveth power to yield any obedience, and accepteth of any obedience that is not perfect. End footnotes. Answer. No, in no wise. The law is spiritual, but we are carnal. 1 Kings 8 verse 46, Genesis 6 verse 5, John 15 verse 5, Romans 7 verse 14, chapter 8 verse 7, 1 John 1 verse 8. Question 4. Did then God give a law which could not be kept? Answer. No, when God gave it, we had power to keep it, which since we have lost in Adam. Genesis 1 verse 26, Ephesians 4 verse 19, Romans 5 verse 12. Question 5. Where to then doth the law now serve? 
answer for two general ends first to be a rule of our duty or to discover to us the obedience of god required secondly to drive us unto christ psalm nineteen verses seven to eleven one timothy one verses eight and nine galatians three verse twenty four question six how doth the law drive us unto christ answer diverse ways as first by laying open unto us the utter disability of our nature to do any good secondly by charging the wrath and curse of god due to sin upon the conscience thirdly by bringing the whole soul under bondage to sin death satan and hell so making us long and seek for a saviour romans seven verses seven to nine galatians three verse nineteen romans three verses nineteen and twenty chapter four verse fifteen chapter five verse twenty galatians three verse ten galatians three verse twenty two hebrews two verse fifteen the greater catechism chapter eight of the state of corrupted nature question one how came this weakness and disability upon us answer by the sin and shameful fall of our first parents footnotes this is that which commonly is called original sin which in general denoteth the whole misery and corruption of our nature as one the guilt of adam's actual sin to us imputed two loss of god's glorious image innocency and holiness three deriving by propagation a nature one defiled with the pollution two laden with the guilt three subdued to the power of sin four a being exposed to all temporal miseries leading to and procuring death five an alienation from god with voluntary obedience to satan and lust six an utter disability to good or to labour for mercy seven eternal damnation of body and soul in hell in footnotes romans five verses twelve and fourteen question two wherein did that hurt us their posterity answer diverse ways first in that we were all guilty of the same breach of covenant with adam being all in him secondly our souls with his were deprived of that holiness innocency and righteousness wherein they were at first created thirdly pollution and defilement of nature came upon us with fourthly an extreme disability of doing anything that is well pleasing unto god by all which we are made obnoxious to the curse john three verse thirty six romans five verse twelve ephesians two verse three genesis three verse ten ephesians four verses twenty three and twenty four colossians three verse ten job fourteen verse four psalm fifty one verse seven john three verse six romans three verse thirteen genesis six verse five ephesians two verse one jeremiah six verse sixteen chapter thirteen verse twenty three romans eight verse seven genesis three verse seventeen galatians three verse ten question three wherein doth the curse of god consist answer in diverse things first in the guilt of death temporal and eternal secondly the loss of the grace and favour of god thirdly guilt and horror of conscience despair and anguish here with fourthly eternal damnation hereafter footnotes all that a natural man hath on this side hell is free mercy in footnotes genesis two verse seventeen romans one verse eighteen chapter five verses twelve and seventeen ephesians two verse three genesis three verse twenty four ezekiel sixteen verses three to five ephesians two verse thirteen genesis three verse ten isaiah forty eight verse twenty two romans three verse nine and nineteen galatians three verse twenty two genesis three verses ten and thirteen john three verse thirty six question four are all men born in this estate answer every one without exception psalm fifty one verse five isaiah fifty three verse six romans three verses nine to twelve ephesians two verse three question five and do they continue therein answer of themselves they cannot otherwise do being able neither to know nor will nor do anything that is spiritually good and pleasing unto god footnotes 
the end of this is Jesus Christ to all that fly for refuge to the hope set before them. End footnotes. Acts 8 verse 31, chapter 16 verse 14, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 14, Ephesians 5 verse 8, John 1 verse 5, Jeremiah 6 verse 16, chapter 13 verse 23, Luke 4 verse 18, Romans 6 verse 16, chapter 8 verse 7, John 6 verse 44, 2 Corinthians 3 verse 5. Question 6. Have they then no way of themselves to escape the curse and wrath of God? Answer. None at all. They can neither satisfy his justice nor fulfill his law. The Greater Catechism, chapter 9, of the Incarnation of Christ. Question 1. Shall all mankind then everlastingly perish? Answer. No. God of his free grace hath prepared a way to redeem and save his elect. John 3, verse 16, Isaiah 53, verse 6. Question 2. What way was this? Answer. By sending his own Son, Jesus Christ, in the likeness of sinful flesh, condemning sin in the flesh. Footnotes. This is that great mystery of godliness that the angels themselves admire, the most transcendent expression of God's infinite love, the laying forth of all the treasure of his wisdom and goodness in footnotes. Romans 8, verse 3. Question 3. Who is this you call his own son? Answer. The second person of the Trinity, co-eternal and of the same deity with his father. John 1, verse 14. Romans 1, verse 3. Galatians 4, verse 4. 1 John 1, verse 1. Question 4. How did God send him? Answer, by causing him to be made flesh of a pure virgin, and to dwell among us, that he might be obedient unto death, the death of the cross. Isaiah 50, verse 6, John 1, verse 14, Luke 1, verse 35, Philippians 2, verse 8, 1 Timothy 3, verse 16. The Greater Catechism, chapter 10, of the Person of Jesus Christ. Question 1. What doth the Scripture teach us of Jesus Christ? Answer, chiefly two things, first his person, or what he is in himself, secondly his offices, or what he is unto us. Footnotes. 1. Though our Saviour Christ be one God with his Father, he is not one person with him. 2. Jesus Christ is God and man in one, not a God and a man, God incarnate, not a man deified. 3. The essential properties of either nature remain in his person, theirs still not communicated unto the other, as of the deity to be eternal everywhere, of the humanity to be born and die. For whatever may be said of either nature may be said of his whole person, so God may be said to die but not the Godhead, the man Christ to be everywhere but not his humanity, for his one person is all this. 5. The monstrous figment of transubstantiation or Christ's corporeal presence in the sacrament fully overthrows our Saviour's human nature and makes him a mere shadow. 6. All natural properties are double in Christ, as will, etc., still distinct, all personal, as subsistence, single. End footnotes. Question 2. What doth it teach of his person? Answer, that he is truly God and perfect man, partaker of the natures of God and man in one person, between whom he is a mediator. John 1 verse 14, Hebrews 2 verse 14 and 15, Ephesians 4 verse 5, 1 Timothy 2 verse 5, 1 John 1 verse 1. Question 3. How prove you Jesus Christ to be truly God? Answer, diverse ways. First, by places of Scripture, speaking of the great God Jehovah in the Old Testament, applied to our Saviour in the New, as Numbers 21, verse 5 and 6, in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 9, Psalm 102, verses 25 to 27, in Hebrews 1, verse 10, Isaiah 6, verses 2 to 4, in John 12, verses 40 and 41, Isaiah 8, verses 13 and 14, in Luke 2, verse 34, Romans 9, verse 33, Isaiah 40, verses 3 and 4, in John 1, verse 23, Isaiah 45, 
verses 22 and 23 in Romans 14, verse 11, Philippians 2, verses 10 and 11, Malachi 3, verse 1 in Matthew 11, verse 10. Secondly, by the works of the deity ascribed unto him, as first of creation, John 1, verse 3, 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6, Hebrews 1, verse 2, secondly, of preservation in providence, Hebrews 1, verse 3, John 5, verse 17, thirdly, miracles. Thirdly, by the essential attributes of God being ascribed unto him, as first, immensity, Matthew 28, verse 20, John 14, verse 23, Ephesians 3, verse 17, secondly, eternity, John 1, verse 1, Revelation 1, verse 11, Micah 5, verse 2, thirdly, immutability, Hebrews 1, verses 11 and 12, fourthly, omniscience, John 21, verse 17, Revelation 2, verse 23, fifthly, majesty and glory equal to his Father, John 5, verse 23, Revelation 5, verse 13, Philippians 1, verse 2, chapter 2, verses 6, 9, and 10. Fourthly, by the names given unto him, as first of God expressly, John 1, verse 1, chapter 20, verse 28, Acts 20, verse 28, Romans 9, verse 5, Philippians 2, verse 6, Hebrews 1, verse 8, 1 Timothy 3, verse 16. Secondly, of the Son of God, John 1, verse 18, Romans 8, verse 3, etc. Question 4. Was it necessary that our Redeemer should be God? Answer. Yes, that he might be able to save to the uttermost and to satisfy the wrath of his Father, which no creature could perform. Isaiah 43, verse 25, chapter 53, verse 6, Daniel 9, verses 17 and 19. Question 5. How prove you that he was a perfect man? Answer. First, by the prophecies that went before, that so he should be. Genesis 3, verse 15, chapter 18, verse 18. Secondly, by the relation of their accomplishment. Matthew 1, verse 1, Romans 1, verse 4, Galatians 4, verse 4. Thirdly, by the scriptures assigning to him those things which are required to a perfect man, as first of body, Luke 24, verse 39, Hebrews 2, verse 17, chapter 10, verse 5, 1 John 1, verse 1, secondly, a soul, Matthew 26, verse 38, Mark 14, verse 34, and therein first a will, Matthew 26, verse 39, secondly, affections, Mark 3, verse 5, Luke 10, verse 21, thirdly, endowments, Luke 2, verse 52. Fourthly, general infirmities of nature, Matthew 4, verse 2, John 4, verse 6, Hebrews 2, verse 18. Question 6. Wherefore was our Redeemer to be man? Answer, that the nature which had offended might suffer and make satisfaction, and so he might be every way a fit and sufficient saviour for men, Hebrews 2, verses 10 to 17. The Greater Catechism, chapter 11, of the offices of Christ, and first of his kingly. Question 1. How many are the offices of Jesus Christ? Answer 3. First of a king, secondly a priest, thirdly a prophet. Footnotes. In the exercise of these offices, Christ is also the sole head, husband, and firstborn of the church, papal usurpation upon these offices of Christ manifests the Pope to be the man of sin. In footnotes. Psalm 2 verse 6, Psalm 105 verse 4, Deuteronomy 18 verse 15. Question 2. Hath he these offices peculiar by nature? Answer. No, he only received them for the present dispensation until the work of redemption be perfected. Psalm 110, verse 1, Acts 2, verse 36, chapter 10, verse 42, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3, chapter 15, verses 27 and 28, Philippians 2, verse 9, Hebrews 3, verses 2 and 6, chapter 2, verses 7 to 9. Question 3. Wherein doth the kingly office of Christ consist? Answer. In a twofold power, first his power of ruling in and over his church, Secondly, his power of subduing his enemies, Psalm 110, verses 3 to 7. Question 4. 
what is his ruling power in and over his people answer that supreme authority which for their everlasting good he useth towards them whereof in general there be two acts first internal and spiritual in converting their souls unto him making them unto himself a willing obedient persevering people secondly external and ecclesiastical in giving perfect laws and rules for their government as gathered into holy societies under him footnotes christ's subjects are all born rebels and are stubborn until he makes them obedient by his word and spirit christ hath not delegated his kingly power of law-making for his church to any here below in footnotes isaiah fifty three verse twelve fifty nine verses twenty and twenty one with hebrews eight verses ten to twelve isaiah sixty one verses one and two john one verse sixteen chapter twelve verse thirty two mark one verse fifteen matthew twenty eight verse twenty two corinthians ten verses four and five matthew sixteen verse nineteen one corinthians twelve verse twenty eight ephesians four verses eight to fourteen two timothy three verses sixteen and seventeen revelation twenty two verses eighteen and nineteen question five how many are the acts of his kingly power towards his enemies answer two also first internal by the mighty working of his word and the spirit of bondage upon their hearts convincing amazing terrifying their consciences hardening their spirits for ruin secondly external in judgments and vengeance which oft times he beginneth in this life and will continue unto eternity footnotes the end of christ in exercising his kingly power over his enemies is the glory of his gospel and the good of his people and footnotes psalm one hundred and ten john six verse forty six chapter eight verse fifty nine chapter nine verse forty one chapter twelve verse forty two corinthians ten verses four to six one corinthians five verse five one timothy one verse twenty mark sixteen verse sixteen luke nineteen verse twenty seven acts thirteen verse eleven revelation seventeen verse fourteen the greater catechism chapter twelve of christ's priestly office question one by what means did jesus christ undertake the office of an eternal priest answer by the decree ordination and will of god his father whereunto he yielded voluntary obedience so that concerning this there was a compact and covenant between them psalm 110 verse 4 hebrews 5 verses 5 and 6 chapter 7 verses 17 and 18 isaiah 50 verses 4 to 6 hebrews 10 verses 5 to 10 psalm 2 verses 7 and 8 isaiah 53 verse 8 and verses 10 to 12 philippians 2 verses 7 and 9 hebrews 12 verse 2 john 17 verses 2 and 4 question 2 wherein doth his execution of this office consist answer in bringing his people unto god hebrews 2 verse 10 chapter 4 verse 16 chapter 7 verse 25 question 3 what are the parts of it answer first oblation secondly intercession footnotes against both these the papists are exceedingly blasphemous against the one by making their mass a sacrifice for sins the other by making saints mediators of intercession and footnotes hebrews nine verse fourteen hebrews seven verse twenty five question four what is the oblation of christ answer the offering up of himself upon the altar of the cross and holy propitiatory sacrifice for the sins of all the elect throughout the world as also the presentation of himself for us in heaven sprinkled with the blood of the covenant isaiah fifty three verses ten and twelve john three verse sixteen chapter eleven verse fifty one chapter seventeen verse nineteen hebrews nine verses thirteen and fourteen hebrews nine verse twenty four question five whereby doth this oblation do good unto us answer diverse ways first in that it satisfied the justice of god 
Secondly, it redeemed us from the power of sin, death, and hell. Thirdly, it ratified the new covenant of grace. Fourthly, it procured for us grace here and glory hereafter, by all which means the peace and reconciliation between God and us is wrought. Ephesians 2 verses 14 and 15. Question 6. How did the oblation of Christ satisfy God's justice for our sin? Answer. In that, for us, he underwent the punishment due to our sin. Footnotes. Christ's undergoing punishment for us was, first, typified by the old sacrifices, secondly, foretold in the first promise, thirdly, made lawful and valid in itself, first, by God's determination, the supreme lawgiver, secondly, his own voluntary undergoing it, thirdly, by a relaxation of the law in regard of the subject punished, fourthly, beneficial to us because united to us, as first our head, secondly, our elder brother, thirdly, our sponsor or surety, fourthly, our husband, fifthly, our God or redeemer, etc. End footnotes. Isaiah 53 verses 4 to 6, John 10 verse 11, Romans 3 verses 25 and 26, chapter 4 verse 25, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21, Ephesians 5 verse 2, 1 Peter 2 verse 24. Question 7. What was that punishment? Answer. The wrath of God, the curse of the law, the pains of hell due to sinners in body and soul. Footnotes. No change in all these, but what necessarily follows the change of the person's sustaining. In footnotes. Genesis 2 verse 17, Deuteronomy 17 verses 15 to 26, Isaiah 59 verse 2, Romans 5 verse 12, Ephesians 2 verse 3, John 3 verse 36, Hebrews 2 verse 14. Question 8. Did Christ undergo all these? Answer. Yes, in respect of the greatness and extremity, not the eternity and continuance of those pains, for it was impossible he should be holden of death. Footnotes. The death that Christ underwent was eternal in its own nature and tendance, not so to him because of his holiness, power, and the unity of his person, and footnotes. Matthew 26, verse 28, Mark 14, verses 33 and 34, chapter 15, verse 34, Galatians 3, verse 13, Ephesians 2, verse 16, Colossians 1, verse 20, Hebrews 5, verse 7, Psalm 18, verse 5. Question 9. How could the punishment of one satisfy for the offence of all? Answer. In that he was not a mere man only, but God also, of infinitely more value than all those who had offended. Footnotes. He suffered not as God, but he suffered who was God. End footnotes. Romans 5 verse 9, Hebrews 9 verse 26, 1 Peter 3 verse 18. Question 10. How did the oblation of Christ redeem us from death and hell? Answer. First, by paying a ransom to God, the judge and lawgiver who had condemned us. Secondly, by overcoming and spoiling Satan, death, and the powers of hell that detained us captives. Footnotes. We are freed from the anger of God by a perfect rendering to the full value of what he required, from the power of Satan by absolute conquest on our behalf. End footnotes. Matthew 20, verse 28, John 6, verse 51, Mark 10, verse 45, Romans 3, verse 25, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 20, Galatians 3, verse 13, Ephesians 1, verse 7, 1 Timothy 2, verse 6, Hebrews 10, verse 9, John 5, verse 24, Colossians 2, verses 13 to 15, 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 10, Hebrews 2, verse 14, 1 Peter 1, verses 18 and 19. Question 11. What was the ransom that Christ paid for us? Answer. His own precious blood. Acts 20, verse 28. 1 Peter 1, verse 19. Question 12. How was the new covenant ratified in his blood? Answer. By being accompanied with his death. For that, as all other testaments, was to be ratified by the death of the testator. Footnotes. The new covenant is Christ's legacy, in his last will unto his people, the eternal inheritance of glory being conveyed thereby. End footnotes. Genesis 22 verse 18, Hebrews 9 verse 16, 
chapter 8, verses 10 to 12. Question 13. What is this new covenant? Answer. The gracious, free, immutable promise of God, made unto all his elect fallen in Adam, to give them Jesus Christ, and in him mercy, pardon, grace, and glory, with a re-stipulation of faith from them unto this promise, and new obedience. Genesis 3, verse 15, Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34, chapter 32, verse 40, Hebrews 8, verses 10 to 12, Galatians 3, verse 8 and 16, Genesis 12, verse 3, Romans 8, verse 32, Ephesians 1, verses 3 and 4, Mark 16, verse 16, John 1, verse 12, chapter 10, verses 27 and 28. Question 14. How did Christ procure for us grace, faith, and glory? Answer. By the way of purchase and merit, for the death of Christ, deservedly procured of God, that he should bless us with all spiritual blessings needful for our coming unto him. Footnotes. The death of Christ was satisfactory in respect of the strict justice of God, meritorious in respect of the covenant between him and his Father. All these holy truths are directly denied by the blasphemous Socinians, and by the Papists, with their merits, masses, penance, and purgatory, by consequent overthrown. And footnotes. Isaiah 53, verses 11 and 12, John 17, verse 2, Acts 20, verse 28, Romans 5, verses 17 and 18, Ephesians 2, verses 15 and 16, chapter 1, verse 4, Philippians 1, verse 29, Titus 2, verse 14, Revelation 1, verses 5 and 6. Question 15. What is the intercession of Christ? Answer. His continual soliciting of God on our behalf, begun here in fervent prayers, continued in heaven by appearing as our advocate at the throne of grace. Footnotes. To make saints our intercessors is to renounce Jesus Christ from being a sufficient saviour. In footnotes. Psalm 2, verse 8, Romans 8, verse 34, Hebrews 7, verse 25, chapter 9, verse 24, chapter 10, verses 19 to 21, 1 John 2, verses 1 and 2, John 17. Question 1. Wherein doth the prophetical office of Christ consist? Answer. In his embassage from God to man, revealing from the bosom of his Father the whole mystery of godliness, the way and truth whereby we must come unto God. Footnotes. Christ differed from all other prophets, first in his sending, which was immediately from the bosom of his Father, secondly his assistance, which was the fullness of the Spirit, thirdly his manner of teaching, with authority. And footnotes. Matthew 5, John 1 verse 18, chapter 3 verse 32, chapter 10 verse 9 and 14, chapter 14 verses 5 and 6, chapter 17 verse 8, chapter 18 verse 37. Question 2. How doth he exercise this office towards us? Answer. By making known the whole doctrine of truth unto us in a saving and spiritual manner. Footnotes. To accuse his word of imperfection in doctrine or discipline is to deny him a perfect prophet, or to have borne witness unto all truth. And footnotes. Deuteronomy 18 verse 18. Isaiah 42 verse 6. Hebrews 3 verse 1. Question 3. By what means doth he perform all this? Answer. Diverse, as first internally and effectually by his Spirit writing his law in our hearts, secondly, outwardly and instrumentally by the word preached. Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 3, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 9, Hebrews 8, verse 10, John 20, verse 31, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 28, Ephesians 4, verses 8 to 13, 2 Peter 1, verse 21. The Greater Catechism, chapter 14, of the Twofold Estate of Christ. Question 1. In what estate or condition doth Christ exercise these offices? Answer. In a twofold estate, first of humiliation or abasement, secondly of exaltation or glory. Footnotes. The humiliation of Christ shows us what we must here do and suffer, his exaltation, what we may hope for. The first of these holds forth his mighty love to us, the other his mighty power in himself. 
The only way to heaven is by the cross. In footnotes. Philippians 2, verses 8 to 10. Question 2. Wherein consisteth the state of Christ's humiliation? Answer. In three things. First, in his incarnation, or being born of a woman. Secondly, his obedience, or fulfilling the whole law, moral and ceremonial. Thirdly, in his passion, or enduring all sorts of miseries, even death itself. Luke 1, verse 35, John 1, verse 14, Romans 1, verse 3, Galatians 4, verse 4, Hebrews 2, verses 9 and 14, Matthew 3, verse 15, chapter 5, verse 17, Luke 2, verse 21, John 8, verse 46, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, 1 Peter 1, verse 19, 1 John 3, verse 5, Isaiah 53, verses 4 to 6, Hebrews 2, verse 9, 1 Peter 2, verse 21. Question 3 wherein consists his exaltation? Answer, in first his resurrection, secondly ascension, thirdly sitting at the right hand of God, by all which he was declared to be the Son of God with power. Matthew 28, verse 18, Romans 1, verse 4, chapter 6, verse 4, Ephesians 4, verse 9, Philippians 2, verse 9 and 10, 1 Timothy 3, verse 16. The Greater Catechism, chapter 15, of the persons to whom the benefits of Christ's office do belong. Question 1. Unto whom do the saving benefits of what Christ performeth in the execution of his offices belong? Answer. Only to his elect. Footnotes. Christ giveth life to all that world for whom he gave his life. None that he died for shall ever die. To say that Christ died for every man universally is to affirm that he did no more for the elect than the reprobates, for them that are saved than for them that are damned, which is the Arminian blasphemy. In footnotes, John 17 verse 9, Isaiah 63 verse 9, Hebrews 3 verse 6, chapter 10 verse 21. Question 2. Died he for no other? Answer, none, in respect of his father's eternal purpose and his own intention of removing wrath from them and procuring grace and glory for them. Acts 20, verse 28, Matthew 20, verse 28, chapter 26, verse 28, Hebrews 9, verse 28, John 11, verse 51 and 52, Isaiah 53, verse 12, John 3, verse 16, chapter 10, verses 11 to 13 and 15, Ephesians 5, verse 25, Romans 8, verses 32 and 34, Galatians 3, verse 13, John 6, verses 37 and 39, Romans 4, verse 25, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 19 and 20. Question 3. What shall become of them for whom Christ died not? Answer. Everlasting torments for their sins, their portion in their own place. Mark 16, verse 16, John 3, verse 36, Matthew 25, verse 41, Acts 1, verse 25. Question 4. For whom doth he make intercession? Answer. Only for those who from eternity were given him by his Father. John 17, Hebrews 7, verses 24 and 25. The Greater Catechism, Chapter 16 of the Church. Question 1. How are the elect called in respect of their obedience unto Christ and union with him? Answer, his church. Acts 20, verse 28, Ephesians 5, verse 32. Question 2, what is the church of Christ? Answer, the whole company of God's elect, called of God, by the word and spirit, out of their natural condition, to the dignity of his children, and united unto Christ their head by faith in the bond of the spirit. Footnotes. The elect angels belong to this church. No distance of time or place breaks the unity of this church, heaven and earth, from the beginning of the world unto the end are comprised in it. No mention in scripture of any church in purgatory. This is the Catholic Church, though that term be not to be found in the word in this sense, the thing itself is obvious. The Pope, challenging unto himself the title of the head of the Catholic Church, is blasphemously rebellious against Jesus Christ. In footnotes. Acts 2 verse 47, 1 Timothy 5 verse 21, Hebrews 12 verses 22 to 24, Romans 1 verses 5 and 6, chapter 9 verse 11 and 24, 1 Corinthians 4 verse 15, 
2 Timothy 1 verse 9, Acts 16 verse 14, John 3 verse 8, 1 Corinthians 4 verse 15, 1 Peter 1 verse 23, Hebrews 8 verse 10, Ephesians 2 verses 11 to 13, Colossians 1 verse 13, Hebrews 2 verses 14 and 15, 1 Peter 2 verse 9, John 17 verse 2, Ephesians 2 verses 18 to 22. Question 3. Is this whole church always in the same state? Answer. No, one part of it is militant, the other triumphant. Question 4. What is the church militant? Answer. That portion of God's elect which in their generation cleaveth unto Christ by faith, and fighteth against the world, flesh, and devil. Ephesians 6, verse 11 and 12, Hebrews 11, verses 13 and 14, chapter 12, verses 1 and 4. Question 5. What is the church triumphant? Answer. That portion of God's people who, having fought their fight and kept the faith, are now in heaven, resting from their labors. Ephesians 5, verse 27, Revelation 3, verse 21, Chapter 14, verse 13. Question 6. Are not the church of the Jews before the birth of Christ and the church of the Christians since two churches? Answer. No, essentially they are but one, differing only in some outward administrations. Footnotes. This is that ark out of which whosoever is shall surely perish. End footnotes. Ephesians 2, verses 11 to 16. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 3, Galatians 4, verses 26 and 27, Hebrews 11, verses 16, 26 and 40. Question 7. Can this church be wholly overthrown on the earth? Answer, no, unless the decree of God may be changed and the promise of Christ fail. Matthew 26, verse 18, chapter 28, verse 20, John 14, verse 16, chapter 17, 1 Timothy 3, verse 15, 2 Timothy 2, verse 19. The Greater Catechism, chapter 17, of Faith. Question 1. By what means do we become actual members of this Church of God? Answer. By a lively, justifying faith, whereby we are united unto Christ, the head thereof. Footnotes. Of this faith, the Holy Spirit is the efficient cause, the Word the instrumental, the law indirectly by discovering our misery, the gospel immediately by holding forth a saviour. End footnotes. Acts 2 verse 47, chapter 13 verse 48, Hebrews 11 verse 6, chapter 12 verse 22 and 23, chapter 4 verse 2, Romans 5 verses 1 and 2, Ephesians 2 verses 13 and 14. Question 2. What is a justifying faith? Answer. A gracious resting upon the free promises of God in Jesus Christ for mercy, with a firm persuasion of heart that God is a reconciled Father unto us in the Son of His love. Footnotes Faith is in the understanding, in respect of its being and subsistence, in the will and heart, in respect of its effectual working. End footnotes 1 Timothy 1 verse 16, Job 13 verse 15, chapter 19 verse 25, Romans 4, verse 5, Hebrews 4, verse 16, Romans 8, verses 38 and 39, Galatians 2, verse 20, 2 Corinthians 5, verses 20 and 21. Question 3. Have all this faith? Answer. None but the elect of God. Titus 1, verse 1, John 10, verse 26, Matthew 13, verse 11, Acts 13, verse 48, Romans 8, verse 30. Question 4. Do not then others believe that make profession? Answer. Yes, with first historical faith or a persuasion that the things written in the word are true, James 2 verse 19. Secondly, temporary faith, which hath some joy of the affections upon unspiritual grounds in the things believed. Matthew 13 verse 20, Mark 6 verse 20, John 2 verses 23 and 24, Acts 8 verse 13. The Greater Catechism, Chapter 18, of our vocation, or God's calling us. Question 1. How come we to have this saving faith? Answer. It is freely bestowed upon us and wrought in us by the Spirit of God in our vocation or calling. John 16, verses 29 and 44, Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, Philippians 1, verse 29, 
2 Thessalonians 1 verse 11. Question 2. What is our vocation, or this calling of God? Answer. The free, gracious act of Almighty God, whereby in Jesus Christ he calleth and translateth us from the state of nature, sin, wrath, and corruption, into the state of grace and union with Christ, by the mighty, effectual working of his Spirit, in the preaching of the Word. Footnotes. Our effectual calling is the first effect of our everlasting election. We have no actual interest in nor right unto Christ until we are thus called. In footnotes. Colossians 1 verses 12 and 13, 2 Timothy 1 verse 9, Deuteronomy 30 verse 6, Ezekiel 36 verse 26, Matthew 11 verses 25 and 26, John 1 verse 13, chapter 3 verse 3 and 8, Ephesians 1 verse 19, Colossians 2 verse 12, 1 Corinthians 4 verse 7, James 1 verse 18, 2 Peter 2 verse 20, Acts 16 verse 14. Question 3. What do we ourselves perform in this change or work of our conversion? Answer. Nothing at all, being merely wrought upon by the free grace and spirit of God, when in ourselves we have no ability to anything that is spiritually good. Footnotes. They who so boast of the strength of free will in the work of our conversion are themselves an example what it is being given up to so vile an error, destitute of the grace of God. In footnotes, Matthew 7 verse 18, chapter 10 verse 20, John 1 verse 13, chapter 15 verse 5, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 3, chapter 2 verse 5, 2 Corinthians 3 verse 5, Ephesians 2 verse 1 and 8, Romans 8 verse 26, Philippians 1 verse 6. Question 4. Doth God thus call all and every one? Answer. All within the pale of the church are outwardly called by the word, none effectually but the elect. Matthew 22 verse 14, Romans 8 verse 30. The Greater Catechism, Chapter 19 of Justification. Question 1. Are we accounted righteous and saved for our faith? when we are thus freely called? Answer. No, but merely by the imputation of the righteousness of Christ, apprehended and applied by faith, for which alone the Lord accepts us as holy and righteous. Isaiah 43, verse 25, Romans 3, verses 23 to 26, chapter 4, verse 5. Question 2. What, then, is our justification or righteousness before God? Answer. The gracious, free act of God imputing the righteousness of Christ to a believing sinner, and for that speaking peace unto his conscience in the pardon of his sin, pronouncing him to be just and accepted before him. Footnotes. Legal and evangelical justification differ, first, on the part of the person to be justified, the one requiring a person legally and perfectly righteous, the other a believing sinner. Secondly, on the part of God, who in the one is a severe righteous judge, in the other a merciful reconciled father. Thirdly, in the sentence which in the one acquitteth, as having done nothing amiss, in the other, as having all amiss pardoned. End footnotes. Genesis 15 verse 6, Acts 13 verses 38 and 39, Luke 18 verse 14, Romans 3 verses 24, 26 and 28, Chapter 4, verses 4 to 8, Galatians 2, verse 16. Question 3. Are we not then righteous before God by our own works? Answer. No, for of themselves they can neither satisfy his justice, fulfill his law, nor endure his trial. Psalm 130, verses 3 and 4. Psalm 143, verse 2. Isaiah 64, verse 6. Luke 17, verse 10. The Greater Catechism, Chapter 20, of Sanctification. Question 1. Is there nothing, then, required of us but faith only? Answer. Yes. Repentance and holiness, or new obedience. Acts 20, verse 21. Matthew 3, verse 2. Luke 13, verse 3. 2 Timothy 2, verse 19. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 7. Hebrews 12, verse 14. Question 2. What is repentance? Answer, godly sorrow for every known sin committed against God, with a firm purpose of heart to cleave unto him for the future, in the killing of sin, the quickening of all graces, to walk before him in newness of life. Footnotes. 
repentance includeth first alteration of the mind into a hatred of sin before loved secondly sorrow of the affections for sin committed thirdly change of the actions arising from both repentance is either legal servile and terrifying from the spirit of bondage or evangelical filial and comforting from the spirit of free grace and liberty which only is available in footnotes 2 corinthians 7 verses 9 to 11 acts 2 verse 37 psalm 51 verse 17 psalm 34 verse 14 isaiah 1 verses 16 and 17 ezekiel 18 verses 27 and 28 acts 14 verse 15 ephesians 5 verses 21 to 24 romans 6 verses 12 13 18 19 chapter 8 verse 1 2 corinthians 5 verse 17 galatians 6 verse 15 question 3 can we do this of ourselves answer no it is a special gift and grace of god which he bestoweth on whom he pleaseth leviticus 20 verse 8 deuteronomy 30 verse 6 ezekiel 11 verses 19 and 20 2 timothy 2 verse 25 acts 11 verse 18 question 4 wherein doth the being of true repentance consist without which it is not acceptable answer in its performance according to the gospel rule with faith and assured hope of divine mercy footnotes every part of popish repentance viz contrition confession and satisfaction was performed by judas End footnotes psalm fifty one one john two verses one and two two corinthians seven verses ten and eleven acts two verse thirty eight matthew twenty six verse seventy five question five what is that holiness which is required of us answer that universal sincere obedience to the whole will of god in our hearts minds wills and actions whereby we are in some measure made conformable to christ our head footnotes all faith and profession without this holiness is vain and of no effect true faith can no more be without true holiness than true fire without heat and footnotes psalm 119 verse 9 1 samuel 15 verse 22 john 14 verse 15 romans 6 verse 19 hebrews 12 verse 14 titus 2 verse 12 2 peter 1 verses 5 to 7 isaiah 1 verses 16 and 17 1 chronicles 28 verse 9 deuteronomy 6 verse 5 matthew 22 verse 37 romans 8 verse 29 1 corinthians 11 verse 1 ephesians 2 verse 21 colossians 3 verses 1 to 3 2 timothy 2 verses 11 and 12 question 6 is this holiness or obedience in us perfect answer yes in respect of all the parts of it but not in respect of the degrees wherein god requires it footnote merit of works in unprofitable servants no way able to do their duty is a popish miracle and footnotes two kings twenty verse three job one verse one matthew five verse forty eight luke one verse six two corinthians seven verse one ephesians four verse twenty four Titus 2 verse 12, Isaiah 64 verse 6, Psalm 130 verse 3, Exodus 28 verse 38, Philippians 3 verse 12. Question 7. Will God accept of that obedience which falls so short of what he requireth? Answer. Yes, from them whose persons he accepteth and justifieth freely in Jesus Christ. Footnotes. In Christ are our persons freely accepted, and for him our obedience in footnotes romans twelve verse one philippians four verse eighteen hebrews thirteen verse sixteen one john three verse twenty two ephesians one verse six question eight what are the parts of this holiness answer internal in the quickening of all graces purging all sins and external in fervent and frequent prayers alms and all manner of righteousness hebrews eleven verse fourteen Ephesians 3, verses 16 and 17, Romans 2, verse 29, chapter 6, verse 12, Matthew 5, verse 20, Romans 8, verses 1 and 2, Ephesians 4, verses 22 and 23, Titus 2, verse 12. Particular precepts are innumerable. 
Question 9. May not others perform these duties acceptably, as well as those that believe? Answer. No, all their performances in this kind are but abominable sins before the Lord. Footnotes. The best duties of unbelievers are but white sins. Proverbs 15, verse 8, John 9, verse 31, Titus 1, verse 15, Hebrews 11, verse 6. The Greater Catechism, chapter 21, of the Privileges of Believers. Question 1. What are the privileges of those that thus believe and repent? Answer. First, union with Christ. Secondly, adoption of children. Thirdly, Christian liberty. Fourthly, a spiritual holy right to the seals of the new covenant. Fifthly, communion with all saints. Sixthly, resurrection of the body unto life eternal. Question 2. What is our union with Christ? Answer. An holy spiritual conjunction unto him as our head husband and foundation, whereby we are made partakers of the same spirit with him, and derive all good things from him. Footnotes. By virtue of this union, Christ suffereth in our afflictions, and we fill up in our bodies what remaineth as his. From Christ, as head of the church, we have spiritual life, sense, and motion, or growth in grace. Secondly, as the husband of the church, love and redemption. Thirdly, as the foundation thereof, stability and perseverance and footnotes 1 corinthians 12 verse 12 john 15 verses 1 and 2 verses 5 to 7 chapter 17 verse 23 ephesians 4 verse 15 chapter 5 verse 23 colossians 1 verse 18 2 corinthians 11 verse 2 ephesians 5 verses 25 to 27 revelation 21 verse 9 Matthew 16, verse 18, Ephesians 2, verses 20 to 22, 1 Peter 2, verses 4 to 7, Romans 8, verses 9 and 11, Galatians 4, verse 6, Philippians 1, verse 19, John 1, verses 12 and 16, Ephesians 1, verse 3. Question 3. What is our adoption? Answer. Our gracious reception into the family of God as his children and co-heirs with Christ. John 1, verse 12. Romans 8, verses 15 and 17, Galatians 4, verse 5, Ephesians 1, verse 5. Question 4. How come we to know this? Answer. By the especial working of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, sealing unto us the promises of God, and raising up our souls to an assured expectation of the promised inheritance. Footnotes. This is that great honour and dignity of believers which exalts them to a despising all earthly thrones, in footnotes Romans 8 verses 15 and 17 Ephesians 4 verse 30 1 John 3 verse 1 Romans 8 verses 19 and 23 Titus 2 verse 13 Question 5 What is our Christian liberty? Answer An holy and spiritual freedom from the slavery of sin the bondage of death and hell the curse of the law Jewish ceremonies and thraldom of conscience purchased for us by Jesus Christ, and revealed to us by the Holy Spirit. Footnotes. Our liberty is our inheritance here below, which we ought to contend for against all opposers. End footnotes. Galatians 5 verse 1, John 8 verses 32, 34 and 36, Romans 6 verses 17 and 18, Isaiah 61 verse 1, 1 John 1 verse 7, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21, Romans 8, verse 15, Hebrews 2, verse 15, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 55 and 57, Galatians 3, verse 13, Ephesians 2, verses 15 and 16, Galatians 4, verse 5, Romans 8, verse 1, Acts 15, verses 10 and 11, Galatians chapter 3, 4 and 5, 2 Corinthians 1, verse 24, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 23, 1 Peter 2, verse 16, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 12. Question 6. Are we then wholly freed from the moral law? Answer. Yes, as a covenant, or as it hath anything in it bringing into bondage, as the curse, power, dominion, and rigid exaction of obedience, but not as it is a rule of life and holiness. Footnotes. Nothing makes men condemn the law as a rule, but hatred of that universal holiness which it doth require. In footnotes, Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 33, Romans 7, verses 1 to 3, 
chapter 6, verse 14, Galatians 3, verses 19 and 24, Romans 8, verse 2, Galatians 5, verse 18, Matthew 5, verse 17, Romans 3, verse 31, chapter 7, verses 13, 22, and 25. Question 7. Are we not freed by Christ from the magistrate's power and human authority? Answer. No. Being ordained of God and commanding for him, we owe them all lawful obedience. Footnotes. Rule and authority are as necessary for human society as fire and water for our lives. In footnotes. Romans 13, verses 1 to 4, 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 and 2, 1 Peter 2, verses 13 to 15. The Greater Catechism, chapter 22, of the Sacraments of the New Covenant in particular, a holy right whereunto is the fourth privilege of believers. Question 1. What are the seals of the New Testament? Answer. Sacraments instituted of Christ to be visible seals and pledges, whereby God in him confirmeth the promises of the covenant to all believers, re-stipulating of them growth in faith and obedience. Mark 16, verse 16, John 3, verse 5, Acts 2, verse 38, chapter 22, verse 16, Romans 4, verse 11, 1 Corinthians 10, verses 2 to 4, chapter 11, verses 26 to 29. Question 2. How doth God by these sacraments bestow grace upon us? Answer, not by any real essential conveying of spiritual grace by corporeal means, but by the way of promise, obsignation, and covenant, confirming the grace wrought in us by the word and spirit. Footnotes. This is one of the greatest mysteries of the Roman magic and juggling, that corporeal elements should have a power to forgive sins and confer spiritual grace. End footnotes. Hebrews 4, verse 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Romans 4, verse 11, chapter 1, verse 17, Mark 16, verse 16, Ephesians 5, verse 26. Question 3. How do our sacraments differ from the sacraments of the Jews? Answer. Accidentally only, in things concerning the outward matter and form, as their number, quality, clearness of signification, and the like, not essentially in the things signified or grace confirmed. 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1, 2, and 3, etc. John 6, verse 35. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7. Philippians 3, verse 3. Colossians 2, verse 11. The Greater Catechism, chapter 23 of Baptism. Question 1. Which are these sacraments? Answer, Baptism and the Lord's Supper. Question 2. What is Baptism? Answer, an holy action appointed of Christ, whereby being sprinkled with water in the name of the whole Trinity by a lawful minister of the Church, we are admitted into the family of God and have the benefits of the blood of Christ confirmed unto us. Footnotes, not the want, but the contempt of this sacrament is damnable. It is hard to say whether the error of the papists requiring baptism of absolute indispensable necessity to the salvation of every infant, or that of the Anabaptists, debarring them from it altogether, be the most uncharitable. End footnotes. Matthew 28 verse 19, Mark 16 verses 15 and 16, Acts 2 verse 41, chapter 8 verse 37, Acts 2 verses 38 and 39, John 3 verse 5, Romans 6, verses 3 to 5, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. Question 3. To whom doth this sacrament belong? Answer. Unto all to whom the promise of the covenant is made, that is, to believers and to their seed. Acts 2, verse 39, Genesis 17, verses 11 and 12, Acts 16, verse 15, Romans 4, verses 10 and 11, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 14. Question 4. How can baptism seal the pardon of all sins to us, all our personal sins following it? Answer. Inasmuch as it is a seal of that promise which gives pardon of all to believers. Acts 2 verse 39, Romans 4 verses 11 and 12. The Greater Catechism, chapter 24 of the Lord's Supper. Question 1. What is the Lord's Supper? Answer, an holy action instituted and appointed by Christ to
to set forth his death and communicate unto us spiritually his body and blood by faith, being represented by bread and wine, blessed by his word and prayer, broken, poured out, and received of believers. Footnotes Baptism is the sacrament of our new birth, this of our father growth in Christ. No part of Christian religion was ever so vilely contaminated and abused by profane wretches as this pure, holy, plain action and institution of our Saviour, witness the popish horrid monster of transubstantiation and their idolatrous mass. End footnotes. Matthew 26, verses 26 to 28, Luke 22, verses 14 to 20, 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 to 25, Luke 22, verse 19, 1 Corinthians 11, verses 25 and 26, Mark 14, verses 22 to 24, 1 Corinthians 11, verses 24 and 25, John 6, verse 63, 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 and 25, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 24, Matthew 26, verse 26, Matthew 26, verse 26, Mark 14, verse 22, Luke 22, verse 19. Question 2. When did Christ appoint this sacrament? Answer. On the night wherein he was betrayed to suffer. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. Question 3. Whence is the right use of it to be learned? Answer. From the word, practice, and actions of our Saviour at its institution. Footnotes. Whatever is more than these is of our own. In footnotes. Question 4. What were the actions of our Saviour to be imitated by us? Answer. First, blessing the elements by prayer. Secondly, breaking the bread and pouring out the wine. Thirdly, distributing them to the receivers, sitting in a table gesture. Matthew 26, verse 26, Mark 14, verse 22, Luke 22, verses 19 and 20, 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 and 24. Question 5. What were the words of Christ? Answer. First, of command, take, eat. Secondly, of promise, this is my body. Thirdly, of institution for perpetual use, this do, etc. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 24 to 26. Question 6. Who are to be receivers of this sacrament? Footnotes. Faith in God's promises, which it doth confirm, union with Christ, whereof it is a seal, and obedience to the right use of the ordinance itself, are required of all receivers. There is not any one action pertaining to the spiritual nature of this sacrament, not any end put upon it by Christ, as first, the partaking of his body and blood, secondly, setting forth his death for us, thirdly, declaring of our union with him and his, but requires faith, grace, and holiness in the receivers. In footnotes, Answer. Those only have a true right to the signs who by faith have an holy interest in Christ, the thing signified. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 27 to 29. John 6, verse 63. Question 7. Do the elements remain bread and wine still after the blessing of them? Answer. Yes, all the spiritual change is wrought by the faith of the receiver, not the words of the giver. To them that believe... They are the body and blood of Christ. John 6, verse 63, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 4, chapter 11, verse 29. The Greater Catechism, chapter 25, of the Communion of Saints, the Fifth Privilege of Believers. Question 1. What is the Communion of Saints? Answer. An holy conjunction between all God's people, wrought by their participation of the same Spirit, whereby we are all made members of that one body whereof Christ is the head. Footnotes. By virtue of this we partake in all the good and evil of the people of God throughout the world. In footnotes. Canticles 6 verse 9, Jeremiah 32 verse 39, John 17 verse 22, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 12, Ephesians 4 verses 3 to 6 and verse 13, 1 John 1 verses 3, 6 and 7. Question 2. Of what sort is this union? Answer. First, spiritual and internal, in the enjoyment of the same spirit and graces, which is the union of the Church Catholic. Secondly, external and ecclesiastical, in the same outward ordinances, which is the union of particular congregations. 
1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 and 13, Ephesians 2, verse 16 and verses 19 to 22, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 17, John 17, verses 11, 21 and 22, John 10, verse 16, Hebrews 2, verse 11, 1 Corinthians 1, verses 10 and 11, Romans 12, verse 5, 1 Corinthians 12, verses 27 and 28, Ephesians 4, verses 11 to 13, Philippians 2, verse 2, Colossians 3, verse 15, 1 Peter 3, verse 8. The Greater Catechism, chapter 25, of the Communion of Saints, the Fifth Privilege of Believers. Question 1. What is the Communion of Saints? Answer. An holy conjunction between all God's people, wrought by their participation of the same Spirit, whereby we are all made members of that one body whereof Christ is the head. Footnotes. By virtue of this we partake in all the good and evil of the people of God throughout the world. In footnotes. Canticles 6 verse 9, Jeremiah 32 verse 39, John 17 verse 22, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 12, Ephesians 4 verses 3 to 6 and verse 13, 1 John 1 verses 3, 6 and 7. Question 2. Of what sort is this union? Answer. First, spiritual and internal, in the enjoyment of the same spirit and graces, which is the union of the Church Catholic. Secondly, external and ecclesiastical, in the same outward ordinances, which is the union of particular congregations. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 and 13, Ephesians 2, verse 16 and verses 19 to 22, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 17, John 17, verses 11, 21 and 22, John 10, verse 16, Hebrews 2, verse 11, 1 Corinthians 1, verses 10 and 11, Romans 12, verse 5, 1 Corinthians 12, verses 27 and 28, Ephesians 4, verses 11 to 13, Philippians 2, verse 2, Colossians 3, verse 15, 1 Peter 3, verse 8. The Greater Catechism, Chapter 26 of Particular Churches. Question 1. What are particular churches? Answer. Peculiar assemblies of professors in one place, under offices of Christ's institution, enjoying the ordinances of God, and leading lives, perceiving their holy calling. Footnotes. Every corruption doth not presently unchurch a people. Unholiness of fellow worshippers defileth not God's ordinances. In footnotes. Acts 11, verse 26, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 17, chapter 11, verse 22, 2 Corinthians 1, verse 1, Acts 20, verse 17 and 28, chapter 14, verse 23, 2 Corinthians 8, verse 23, Hebrews 13, verse 17, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 5, Revelation 2, verses 1 to 3, 2 Thessalonians 3, verses 5, 6 and 11, Galatians 6, verse 16, Philippians 3, verse 17, 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 12. Question 2. What are the ordinary offices of such churches? Answer. First, pastors or doctors to teach and exhort. Secondly, elders to assist in rule and government. Thirdly, deacons to provide for the poor. Footnotes. Ministers are the bishops of the Lord. Lord bishops came from Rome. End footnotes. Romans 12, verses 7 and 8, Ephesians 4, verse 11, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 28, Romans 12, verse 8, 1 Timothy 5, verse 17, Acts 6, verses 2 and 3. Question 3. What is required of these officers, especially the chiefest or ministers? Answer. That they be faithful in the ministry committed unto them, sedulous in dispensing the word, watching for the good of their souls committed to them, going before them in an example of all godliness and holiness of life. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 2, Acts 20 verses 18 to 20, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15, chapter 4 verses 1 to 5, Titus 1 verse 13, 1 Timothy 4 verses 15 and 16, Titus 2 verse 7, 1 Timothy 4 verse 12, Matthew 5 verse 16, Acts 24 verse 16. Question 4. What is required in the people unto them? Answer. Obedience to their message and ministry, honour and love to their persons, maintenance to them and their families. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 20, Romans 6 verse 14, Hebrews 13 verse 17, 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 14, 
Romans 16, verse 19, 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4 to 6, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 1, Galatians 4, verse 14, 1 Timothy 5, verse 17 and 18, Luke 10, verse 7, James 5, verse 4, 1 Timothy 5, verses 17 and 18, 1 Corinthians 9, verses 9 to 13, the Greater Catechism, chapter 27, of the last privilege of believers, being the door of entrance into glory. Question 1. What is the resurrection of the flesh? Answer. An act of the mighty power of God's Holy Spirit, applying unto us the virtue of Christ's resurrection, whereby at the last day he will raise our whole bodies from the dust, to be united again unto our souls in everlasting happiness. Footnotes. The resurrection of the flesh hereafter is a powerful motive to live after the spirit here. In footnotes, Job 19 verses 25 to 27, Psalm 16 verses 9 to 11, Isaiah 26 verse 19, Ezekiel 37 verses 2 and 3, Daniel 12 verse 2, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 16, etc. Revelation 20 verses 12 and 13. Question 2. What is the end of this whole dispensation? Answer. The glory of God in our eternal salvation. To him be all glory and honour for evermore. Amen.